unlocking the potential of the Indigenous estate is uh, something that will occupy both uh, the current board and the, uh, the executive of both the ILC and the Indigenous Business Australia going forward well after my time. So maximum, the, I've got nine points that I'd like to make and then just go through a very quick slide on a snapshot, which is what we do in both organisations and the investments that we make. Maximising the productive use and, and realising economic potential of marginal agricultural land is a challenge and will be an ongoing challenge that has long haunted Australia and its policymakers. Put more broadly, this is a challenge that is in, inextricably linked with Australia's own economic development since European settlement. In this panel discussion, I'll be focusing on two key issues that are of critical importance in any policy framework or system about extracting maximum value efficiently from marginal agricultural land, and a lot of it owned by Aboriginal people. Firstly, the importance of a commitment to a long lead time of collaboration and engagement of the rights and interests of ATSI people. And secondly, the need to establish a rigorous ecosystem and structure to support ATSI economic development, ATSI being Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. The concept of the Indigenous estate, which we started about two, three years ago, uh, helps frames this discussion. It's not a one-stop shop, but it's a collective of all the assets and ownings uh, of land that are, that are held within. The concept helps frame this discussion. It makes clear the inextricable touch points that Australia's continuing economic development has with the rights and inter interests of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. To unlock the potential of marginal areas of agricultural land and the Indigenous estate, we need to recognise the importance and role of public and private investment. This requires establishing the right ecosystem. We need to understand the nature of the assets, ensure there is political and social stability, that there are clear processes in place, that the rights and interests of ATSI people are adequately protected and recognised, and that relevant institutions are adequately equipped and resourced. In this regard, the two organisations I lead as chair, the IBA and the ILC, are key enablers for assisting investment in and collaboration with Indigenous people and ideas. And in the Indigenous-led projects which assist to convert the assets of the Indigenous estates into enduring assets and outcomes for ATSI communities and people. IBA, in its role, is a commercially focused government agency or Commonwealth agency with a vision of a nation in which first Australians are economically independent and are, and are an integral part of the Australian economy. Across Northern Australia, IBA has a suite of commercial partnerships that support Indigenous investments. The ILC similarly plays an essential enabling role for ATSI-led economic development through its core functions of strategic investment in land acquisition and management of Indigenous held land. Through collaboration and partnerships with Indigenous landholders, corporations and industries, the ILC aims to create commercial opportunities for Indigenous Australians through the sustainable ownership and management within the estate. Ultimately, a comprehensive system design approach is what is required for developments to be successful and for the potential of marginal areas of land to be unlocked, with, of course, the Indigenous estate a fundamental part of any successful system or policy framework. So that there is a clear understanding of just how large this is, the, the yet-to-be-defined mapping in size is somewhere between 40 and 42 per cent of the north that is under Indigenous land ownership. So when you overlay that with native title, it becomes even bigger in terms of Indigenous interests. And probably on an Australia, wide land mass probably equals to about 80% of the land mass has an Indigenous component that you must deal with at law. To summarise, we therefore require, as part of our foundational settings, a complementary relationship that lays bare the two-way nature of what I call, or what is known as, the demand-demand relationship between the Indigenous estate and involved parties. And as I said on national radio this morning, it's not about I demand and you demand, it's about understanding the demands of the push and pull factors and the motivating factors of communities as we go forward and the demand of investors, of why they want to invest, what's driving their demand, which is generally based on commodity cycles. 
I just want to turn quickly to a snapshot of the IBA and the ILC. So what is the Indigenous estate? It's obviously everything that um, intangible, as we call it, are all the lands and waters and all the assets that are held within and the intangible, which is the cultural and intellectual property rights in language, culture, arts, traditional, traditional environmental practices and other forms of traditional knowledge. And you might say, well, how does that work on traditional practices? Well, one of the things we have done in ILC is we've got a, a, an arrangement with um, INPEX as part of a carbon uh, footprint where um, we're doing carbon farming. The Indigenous state is dynamic. As I said before, it covers up to roughly 40% of the Australian landmass and it is still growing. It is growing through granting uh, these assets or divesting them to Indigenous uh, groups. Uh, we acquire them, we develop and manage them. Uh, we invest in these uh, through funds from royalties and rents from resources uh, that Indigenous groups are, um, are, are lucky enough to, to have struck with uh, particularly um, proponent developments in their resource in hydrochemical, uh, hydrocarbon industry, gas and oil. Development and growth of Indigenous businesses and obviously the, revitalis the revitalisation and enhancement of the intellectual property group. Understanding the Indigenous estate is one of the big challenges for us and I suggest it's a big challenge for, for the Australian Government on how to maximise all the opportunities that we seek going forward over the next 30 years. The future of the Indigenous estate, as I said, we need to engage uh, with the assets and the potentiality of the Indigenous estate, particularly the leaders, the, the key Indigenous in institutions who govern access to the estate. We need to develop a framework um, that, that enables us to identify and communicate opportunity, understand its risks and all its priorities, particularly for the Indigenous groups. We need to have the right advice, simple to say the right advice, but we need quality advice on a whole range of matters that interact with this. And we need to identify a very clear, clear line of sight pathways uh, for engagement. We need to ensure that these outcomes are sustainable and that there is attainment in all of this and that there is the ability to yield this asset in a way that has never been thought of before. So there's going to have to require a lot of critical thinking around this and pulling this all together. We need to develop partnerships to build capacity and expertise and to link the Indigenous estate and the appropriate expertise and advice to the wider Australian economy. This is not us sitting as a silo separate to the Australian economy. It is part of the landmass and it should be part of the GDP going forward, particularly over the next 30 years. We need to establish an acting environment for investment through the development of partnerships and obviously through public and private uh, relationship. A snapshot of the IBA, our, our current book is around 1.4 bill. Um, we invest in home ownership. We plan an area in home ownership and in SMEs on uh, small businesses in high risk areas. They can't get money from the banks, but we, um, uh, we invest in uh, people. And uh, when you make a comparison, uh, we're doing pretty well. Uh, the example is, is that uh, with uh, particular on SMEs, um, we changed the modelling around on that in the last three years and we've landed with an outcome where 66% of our, our loans are surviving after three years, employing 1,260-odd people uh, versus the, the standard market position where there are about 60% equivalents exiting the market. So we, we have certainly spent a lot of time on remodelling this and retensioning on how we go about improving the business outcomes for Indigenous people. And as you see, it's an Australia-wide platform. Um, the ILC has to operate of, on a, IBA has to live off its own earnings. We don't get a lot of money from the government. We get some appropriations, but basically we live, we live off our own earnings. And in retentioning the, the IBA uh, to, a, um, uh, to a new mandate, we have certainly arrived at a, uh, at a position in the last two years where um, it's punching well above its weight. In fact, we've doubled all of our outcomes. We're generally tracking on home loans around 530 a year. We'll probably get close to 1,000 home ownership loans this year. So we have remodelled everything and we are driving quite hard on this. The ILC's contribution to the Indigenous state is quite massive. It's been in place since 95. We've probably spent just over a billion dollars. Um, now, where does a billion dollars come from? 
as for some of you who may or may not know, the ILC gets its existence from the Mabo decision of 92, and the ILC was created out of that through legislation and money was put to one side. We live off the interest of that. Uh, just recently, you may have seen or may not have seen, um, we did a, a quite a series of work around what's called the land account to move it from its current investment settings into uh, what we call, what is now known as the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander CN Land uh, Future Fund in perpetuity uh, to inside the future fund management structure. So what does that really mean? It means that for the first time in the history of, of this country, uh, in this particular area, there is what you might call a default sovereign wealth platform that will underwrite the Indigenous estate with the ILC going forward on all of these things. And as you can see, we've, we've spent uh, quite a bit of money. We've bought roughly 6.1 million hectares. We've divested about 77% of that to Indigenous groups. And so that you know, we don't, um, we don't give up the land. We, we stick a waiver on it. If it falls over, we'll recover it, triage it, get them back on their foot, footings again and move them forward. And as you know, businesses don't strike it the first time round. you just got to keep develop, developing as you go forward. Our, our focus, our five, six key areas where we focus is in agribusiness, uh, which we're now retentioning uh, on, our tourism, our niche indigenous products that uh, we're looking at, uh, renewables, uh, urban development and water-based activities. And on renewables, in, uh, particularly in the IBA, we've just done a, a deal out of Northern, we've announced that. It's a 10 megawatt uh, solar farm. Uh, we're in a 50-50 joint venture with the, the Noongar Group out of Perth, um, and also uh, the platform itself um, is in a joint venture with uh, Carnegie Energy and, and as part of Energy Made Clean. So, and that is underway and that's quite a, quite a nice model. The way that I look at everything is the world that I've been living in the last 30 years is the mining and resource sector and everything we do is project managed. And uh, listening to the other speakers coming forward and reading more and more about this space, uh, in the three years that I've been involved, I can't help but think that we seem to be stuck in project generation. Um, so my thinking has been to bring ILC and IBA back into project generation, and particularly with the ILC, understand what is our land and what are our assets and how do we go about it from there. Delineate it, sterilise it, work out where we're going to go from here and then get it into what you might call the, the scope of work and the feasibility and where you're going to land um, in X time. We'll then move to what I call getting into understanding what is the estate, what does it comprise of, and what will the foundational settings be to drive the commercialisation of it. We need to have the right policy settings, and as I've heard, we've heard already from Sue, the, the right uh, policies is going to give us the, the appropriate hard infrastructure and soft infrastructure around all of this. We don't, we don't have a mortgage on all of this knowledge. We need to share our ideas. We need to bring as a collegiate on all of these matters to drive the very best we can out of these assets. Because one of the things we do know is that the Pacific Rim in the coming years is going to get quite large in terms of the demand on all the fibre that is produced off this country. Getting our settings right now, getting the right... Um, investment platforms in place, getting the right policies in place around infrastructure and the soft infrastructure, the universities uh, that need to start taking a, a very high interest in what to do about this going forward as the demand grows and grows and grows. And then ultimately, we, we move into stage three, which is the commercialisation and production. Now that doesn't follow step by step by step. Generally, you know, you'd start these things in parallel with each other, so that they're not um, definitive in, the, in, their, in their areas. But the, the overall concept is to get it sustainable and viable, but at the core of it is the Indigenous wellbeing. And I mentioned earlier about the demand-demand <coughs> um, scenario that we, we, in relationship, that complements each other. It's about understanding these communities where all these land holdings are, understanding that, the, that they have a set of demands that is not necessarily about I demand this and you must give it to me. Their demands are the demands that are not spoken about. It's about the well-being that each and one of you enjoy every day of your life that they don't enjoy. 
Those demands, they can't speak about it because they can't articulate it enough because generally they're not able to art articulate it. So when the demand of, a, of an investor and the government is wanting to access land and, and set up the best easement uh, or the best um, access to that land, understanding the demands of both parties needs, is very, very critical and it needs to be complementary to each other. You know, in the mining world, we, we, we produce these EISs, environmental impact statements, before we can get a mining uh, licence. And we write this stuff and we say, this is what we're going to do. But ultimately, we're only visitors. Um, and when we exit, um, I always ask myself when I go into... And I've been on a lot of projects where I've had to shut projects down. And, and, I've, and I've asked myself a simple question. What's been left behind? And we've visited the area, we've extrapolated the, 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 the resource, the community is still the same, if not worse. So with agriculture, uh, land development, water rights, uh, water access, um, agricultural development that has actually got a, a net flow back to the community will become very critical for this government as we go forward. And there's one reason and one reason only. The indigenous population is growing at a rate of 2.3% per annum. It is outstripping our capability, even our social settings, to pay for that. So we've got to get this work underway and we've got to get the land to start yielding collectively in a framework. They can opt in or they can opt out, but at least we give them the choice. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.